both of them know exactly the attack line they want to land. Yeah. Tony Blair's can be summed up in one word, weak. He's basically saying John Major is being pushed around and bullied by his party, whereas Tony Blair has taken control of his. John Major, on the other hand, is saying Tony Blair is being fundamentally mendacious, he's lying, and that he has more in common with, and that he doesn't really control his party and that he is not being honest about his political intentions. And actually, you could take that and superimpose it on the PMQs that we have every week with Rishi Sanak and Keir Starmer, and it would be all the better for it. 97, polls showing Labour's lead over the Conservatives at 25 points as the Prime Minister, a former Chancellor, took over from a woman who slightly lost the plot. Uh, John Major, read Rishi Sunak, uh, he was being, um, it was expected he was likely to rule out in early elections, even speculation uh, in January 97 that he might uh, go early and not hang on until May. Of course, he did. But here we go then. We are going back uh, to Thursday, January the 30th, 1997. Historic, classic PMQs unpacked for heads of the Commons now. Of course, the Speaker, Betty Boothroyd, starting proceedings. Questions to the Prime Minister, Mr Jerry Sutcliffe. Number one, Madam Speaker. Yeah. <coughs> this morning I presided at a meeting of the Cabinet and had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall be having further meetings later today. So uh, the Labour MP, Jerry Sutcliffe, uh, as is traditional, kicking off, asking for the official engagement of the Prime Minister. And uh, interestingly, John Major saying he's uh, presided over Cabinet. So Cabinet on a Thursday, not on a Tuesday. It's very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's that interesting. Well, it's mildly it's interesting. <laughs> if you don't find that interesting, the rest of this is going to be really hard work. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll come back to Joey Sutcliffe because I think it, um, he might be one of the best of the rest on the back benches, but this is what we're really here for. Uh, let's kick off then. Uh, this is uh, Tony Blair, question number one to the Prime Minister John Major on this classic PMQ's Unpacked. Mr Tony Blair. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, a, a few weeks ago... The Prime Minister said that it was essential in the national interest that our options remained open on a single currency and that he expected Conservative candidates to stand on that national manifesto. Is that still his expectation of Conservative candidates? I think the Right Honourable Gentleman, before taking me to task on this, before taking me to task on this, should perhaps talk to the scores of his own MPs that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Bethnal Green and Stepney said, would oppose his stance. That's Peter Shaw, the former the, minister. As the Right Honourable Gentleman said, and I quote, I think it's an obligation to be honest with my own electorate, the Right Honourable Gentleman said. <laughs> but the Right Honourable Gentleman wouldn't understand that. He, he entered the House on an election address which demanded Britain's withdrawal from the community. <laughs> Even though, Madam Speaker, he said later, I wasn't actually opposed to membership of the European community. I said within the closed doors of the Labour Party that I disagreed with the policy. <laughs> Behind closed doors, he says one thing, in public another. Not the politics of conviction, but convenience. Saying anything to get a vote. And that is what he advocates to his candidates. OK, let's... Let's, let's pause it there. Um, interest. So, so give us the background to this, uh, Patrick. This is an argument about, in the run-up to the election in 97, would Conservative candidates promise to remain open to Britain during the Euro? John Major wanted to keep his options open, but a lot by this point, a lot of Conservative candidates were saying, well, I'm a post, you know, we are the party of saving the pound. Exactly, and you have Jimmy Goldsmith's referendum party breathing down the necks of Conservative MPs during this point. I mean, uh, I can't remember if it's on the front page or uh, on the page. Around this time, a, a Tory MP called George Gardner uh, is deselected by his local association and later joins Jimmy Goldsmith's rec uh, referendum party. So while the big policy question for John Major is, do we join the Euro or not? The party political question is, I will never be able to shepherd Tory MPs into a position where they do that, much like with the problem David Cameron later had with an EU referendum. Once that option was on the table, lots of them, scared of UKIP or out of ideological conviction, made the decision to back Brexit despite what the, the, the Prime Minister was saying. And it's interesting, John Major's defence there 
is to employ the same sort of lines we now hear about Keir Starmer. You say one thing to the Labour Party, you said this when you were elected in 1983, now you're saying another, we can't possibly trust you. And what's so interesting from a historical perspective, this, this you know, for, for, for younger listeners, uh, John Major there pointed out that Tony Blair, when elected in 1983, he came in in the, in the election, which was a landslide for Margaret Thatcher, but uh, Michael Foote's uh, manifesto, uh, opposed mm. Britain's membership of the European community. Tony Blair was elected on the promise of taking Britain out of Europe. And given what we know now about Tony Blair, and he wanted to go into the single currency in the face of the Remain campaign uh, and so on. Uh, and the, his defence for that was, I I wasn't actually opposed to membership of the European Commission. I said that within the, <laughs> I mean, said within the closed doors of the Labour Party, I disagree with that policy. That's, I mean, exactly that's almost what Keir Starmer says about Jerry Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn exactly. and anti-Semitism. Yeah. And it's also very interesting to hear uh, John Major cite Peter Shaw. Now, Peter Shaw, more or less forgotten by mainstream politics, was a very idiosyncratic. A uh, big Labour figure in the 70s and 80s who were, had a very sort of uh, unique pro-NATO, anti-EU sort of very distinctive politics. It's a Labour tradition that's basically died. Um, but it's very interesting. We'll see a little bit more of this from John Major, I'm sure, to have party grandees thrown at Tony Blair and also Labour Brexiteers on the left uh, broadly speaking, on the left of the Labour Party or on the sort of on the old right mm. of the Labour Party, so to Tony Blair's left. Too many directions here. But basically, <laughs> to, to have sort of, uh, not extremists, but eccentric figures in the Labour firmament in a very message-disciplined time, saying, well, hang on, Tony, you say this, and Alistair Campbell tells all your MPs to say this, but look at all these people on the fringe of the Labour Party saying other things, and that's something we still see today too. And what's so interesting about this, this exchange is that, you know, the, the perception that... Uh, Tony Blair was the guy who could walk on water. Everyone was fully behind him. You know, he didn't even have his own MPs fully behind him. While John Major was this sort of slightly joke figure. Yeah, you know, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, you know, if he was, if you just analysed that exchange, John Major came out on top of that one. Yeah, completely. Um, so let's find out what happens now. Remember, only three questions from the leader of the opposition. Let's go back to the House of Commons on this classic PMQs unpacked. Uh, this is question two from Tony Blair. Madam Speaker, if I can, Madam Speaker. The Labour Party put its manifesto to its membership and got 95% support. I doubt that he could put his manifesto yeah. to his cabinet and get 95% support. After all, I was only asking him to agree with what he himself said a few weeks ago. Well, if he can't say that he now expects Conservative candidates to do that, has he still the vestige of authority and courage left to stand at that dispatch box and say now that at least he strongly urges and seeks to persuade Conservative candidates to stand on his and the government's position? That honourable gentleman is just being plain silly. Is he telling, is he telling this House that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Honourable Member for Bolsover, the Right Honourable Dennis Gentleman Skinner, for Chesterfield, the Honourable Tony Gentleman ben, for Newham, are actually going Nigel to support Spearing. his policy on Europe at the general election. He raises it on this day of all days. The first two Labour questioners on the order paper are both amongst the 50 who say we should not join a single currency. He may ask, he may ask his candidates to fib to the electorate, our candidates will set out their views. We will follow. We will follow the policy that the government have set out. And people know our policy. What he's trying to do is to censor and smother what his party stands for. It's pretty feisty, this. I mean, first of all, I'm going to say, um, Patrick Guy, an almost incomprehensible question from Tony Blair. Mm. I mean, it, it, you, so much assumed... Not. I mean, we're so far away from clipping for social media. I mean, it is sort of a question, but it, it's a bit sort of... It gets. It's quite in the weeds on this question of whether or not Conservative candidates will have to sign up to the position of the Prime Minister. Uh, which is to be, at least be open to the yeah. single currency. It's not even to endorse single currency. And Tony Blair is now asking him to say, well, if you cannot guarantee that your candidates will endorse your policy of being open to the single currency, can you at least say you'll try to persuade them? Yeah. Uh, which, you know, uh, John Major uh, doesn't go on uh, to do. But what makes this quite such a feisty and 
satisfying exchange listening now as two people who listen to PMQs every week is that both of them know exactly the attack line they want to land. Yeah. Tony Blair's can be summed up in one word, weak. He's basically saying John Major is being pushed around and bullied by his party, whereas Tony Blair has taken control of his. John Major, on the other hand, is saying Tony Blair is being fundamentally mendacious, he's lying, and that he has more in common with, and that he doesn't really control his party and that he is not being honest about his political intentions. And actually, you could take that and superimpose it on the PMQs that we have every week with Rishi Sanak and Keir Starmer, and it would be all the better for it. Mm. Neither of them can quite work out what their attack is on, on the other. You know, Rishi Sunak can't work out, is Keir Starmer a, a socialist danger who's going to you know, nationalise the nation and put us all into debt? Or is he someone who doesn't have a plan? You can't not, you can't both have a plan to turn us into Venezuela and not have a plan. Mm. And similarly, the to Labour Party can't quite work out where it is on Rishi Sunak. Is he sort of a dangerous right winger? Is he someone who doesn't break, keep his promises? Is he, is he weak? And they haven't quite sort of landed on that. No, 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 exactly. And I also, conversely, neither have number 10... Yeah. on Keir Starmer. Yeah. But it just goes to show, and, and that is something Tony Blair himself said, that's how Tony Blair used PMQs, to define and test out attack lines against his rivals. And that's the one purpose it served. But I don't think either Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak have perfected that one word. You know, Tony Blair would say, Major was weak, William Hague was good on jokes, but terrible on substance, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. OK, but well, here we go. This is the last exchange from the front benches, anyway. Uh, this is question number three on classic PMQs Unpacked. We go back to the comments. Question three from Tony Blair. I asked him two questions. I said, as he himself said a few weeks ago, does he expect them to stand on the same manifesto? I answer it, yes. I then asked him, will he at least seek to persuade people to stand on the same manifesto? I answer yes. He is so weak and powerless he can't even say. I mean, well, is it not weak? He cannot, he cannot, he cannot even get to that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is it not extraordinary? Order, order, oh, order, order, up. come to order. <laughs> extraordinary. Isn't it extraordinary that the Prime Minister of our country can't even urge his party to support his own position? Yeah. Yeah. Weak, weak, weak. Yeah. Weak. And I tell him, is the reason his weakness and his failure of leadership are the reason his government is the incompetent mess it is. Whenever, whenever the right honourable gentleman gets abusive, we know he's losing. We know he's losing. If he is concerned about strength, will he today sack the honourable member for Oldham East, who yesterday contradicted what he said about tax? That's Michael Meacher. Will he today sack the deputy chief whip of the Labour Party, who yesterday contradicted what it was said about tax? All he does is heckle and waft his arms around in a hopeless gesture. Yes or no? Will he sack them or not? His policy, they are members of his shadow cabinet, they have denied his policy. We have set out consistently what our policy is. I have said it is important to keep the options, all of the options open, all of the options open. The Honourable Gentleman Sniggers, I'm quoting his words, not mine. <laughs> keep all of the options open. He has followed in grandmother's footsteps in following policy after policy of ours. He says we should keep the options open. We keep the options open, but his policy apparently means something quite different because he dare not admit what his policy is. And it all, uh, it all uh, kicks off a bit. So, the, the reason we've chosen this PMQs is because it's the weak, weak, weak. Weak, what it turns out. There's a fourth week that, that, that often gets cut out of the, uh, of the sound bite. So, it's famous for that. And, you know, it's a defining moment where Tony Blair, you know, tied up John Major and put a bow on it. Actually, this is more evenly... Uh, um, uh, balanced. John Major definitely gives as good as he gets. 
That's certainly true. And Tony Blair doesn't really have any rejoinder uh, to any of the questions. I mean, let's zero in on the mention of Michael Meacher, who was a shadow cabinet minister, uh, who would have been destined for the cabinet, but in 1997 or late 1996, I can't remember which, around the, around the time uh, of uh, this PMQ, so, uh, indeed the day before, Michael Meacher said, look, Gordon Brown said we're not going to raise taxes on personal income. But there's certainly lots of other taxes we can raise. Michael Meacher was then not put in the in the cabinet, right? That that shows you that the attacks John Major was making did wound Tony Blair. This is exactly the stuff Tony Blair and Gordon Brown worried about. The things that uh, uh, John Major is highlighting here. So this idea that you know Tony Blair was running rings around John Major all the time uh, isn't necessarily true, and it's, it maybe goes to show how you know if you read some of the coverage from the uh, from the time, it's easy to laugh at in hindsight because it's all sort of, are the polls wrong? You know, will the people who say they don't know return to the Tories? Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell and others were terrified and didn't really believe that they could win the sort of uh, landslide that was projected. And you can, but you can sort of understand listening yeah. to the day-to-day -day politics here. John Major has a coherent and wounding attack on the Labour Party here. Do you know what grandmother's footsteps are? The, the, isn't <laughs> it seems to be like an old get like a children's is, game is it not where you stand on the, the if you're a kid and you stand on the feet of your parents uh, oh when you do that yeah I no, don't know it's I'm a, just guessing there's a, online, it's a game where one person's grandmother or grandfather and they stand with their back to the class so everyone else has to sneak up on them and try and touch them <laughs> the grandparent could turn around with it. that's a bit like um, what's the time Mr Wolf isn't it <laughs> But I don't know what he means Doesn't by really he's work. followed in grandmother's footsteps. But again, in following policy after policy of ours. And then again, this, the, the, the parallels with today, where the Tories accuse Labour of nicking their policies, Labour accused the Tories of nicking their policies, uh, and so on. But again, you know, going right to the heart of, of leadership. And maybe I suppose a reminder that actually, even if, if Rishi Sunak was doing very well at PMQs, um, it might not actually make any difference to the overall outcome of the uh, Well, indeed, election. William Hague won countless sessions of PMQs and at the end of that parliament, the Bank of England was still independent and Britain still had a national minimum wage because if you win at PMQs, it doesn't necessarily mean you win an election. Yeah, and actually, you know, maybe maybe because over the next couple of weeks there isn't um, PMQ, so maybe we can revisit a William Hague, Tony mm. Blair one, to see how well he did. Uh, right, let's do the best of the rest then, as we always do with PMQs Unpacked. Uh, no PMQs this week because Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer and the rest of them, they're all on recess, working hard in their constituencies, I'm sure. Um, uh, so Henry Zeffman has just been in touch, by the way, to say he used to play Grandma's footsteps in the playground. Well, there we are. Maybe it's a London thing, he says. That's, that's BBC's Henry Zeffman listening to Times Radio. Morning, Henry. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's... Um, so we've, we're, we're doing classic PMQs. This is from uh, Thursday, January 30th, 1997. We've had the key exchanges from Tony Blair and, uh, and John Major. Let's go now to a backbench question. What, I don't know what this guy's first name is. Ashby. What's his name? Uh, David Ashby. Let's go to the comments. David Ashby. Has my right honourable friend seen the statement? Has my right honourable friend seen the statement? Oh, order, order, order. <laughs> order, if, there, if, if anyone has been abusive, they will indicate it to me. <laughs> order, order, order. I think there are a lot of members of this house that have got a, a good deal of pre election tension. <laughs> Time. There are members I want to call, Ashby. Talkative speaker, not a new thing. My right honourable friend has He's undoubtedly been... seen the statement of the chairman of Toyota. Does my right honourable friend not agree that Toyota came to this country because this co my honourable right honourable friend's uh, policies provided the most favourable climate for companies such as Toyota to have a gateway into Europe? Does not his statement show that it is important that we should maintain that gateway and important that we should maintain our foot in Europe so that uh, we get uh, increased uh, 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 investment? John Major. We intend, to maintain, we intend to maintain our voice in Europe. There should be absolutely no doubt about that. What we do not intend to do is to slavishly follow whatever might happy, happen to be the favoured policy of some European governments at any, at any particular point in time. 
We are not going to follow policies that would be damaging to British interests. We are not going to sign social chapters. The deputy leaders back here scoffing as usual. I will tell the deputy leader of the Labour Party. John Prescott, one course. signature on the social chapter will mean half a million signatures on the dole. So there we are. That was uh, a question the, from David Ashby, the Conservative MP for North West Leicestershire. Now, of course, uh, present, uh, represented by... One, um, uh, Andrew Bridgen. Andrew Bridgen. Uh, so, uh, lucky them. Um, now, the reason this, this, quote, this exchange is so interesting is because it's 1997. It would be 20 years before Britain, or a bit less, before Britain would vote to leave the EU. But you can see the seeds being sown then, this debate about Britain's place in Europe. Toyota, uh, it was on the front, of the front of the Times that day, the, the boss of Toyota saying, Britain must join the single currency, join the euro or risk losing Japanese investment. We had then had all those arguments again in, in the run-up to the Well, referendum. with Nissan and Sunderland. Yeah. And it's this sort of argument that's rehearsed time and time and again. And you see the outsized role of the manufacturing industry, particularly car manufacturers, in determining how politicians talk about and conceive of Britain's relationship with Europe. And remember, too, David Davis in 2017 saying, don't worry, uh, all of the... German car manufacturers will be knocking on Angela Merkel's, do <laughs> Merkel's door and then we'll get a fantastic deal. And also, you can understand, if, you, if you're a Eurosceptic listening to this and you hear uh, uh, Nigel Ashby there saying, uh, you know, we need to have a, the most uh, favourable possible trading relationship with Europe, you read the front page of the following day's Times, Chairman of Torch saying, look, it would be a terrible idea if Britain didn't join the Euro and would really jeopardise our presence here. And you see, look, the car British car industry isn't what it was, but there's a lot of inward investment into the British car industry at the moment. You can understand why Eurosceptics reading that would say, well, hang on, we've had all of these doomsaying predictions before about not joining the euro, about leaving the EU, about leaving the single market. You know, it happens again and again and again. Look, we've still got a car industry in this country. So it's interesting yeah. tracing some of these arguments and the apocalyptic predictions not having come to not pass. Not having come to pass, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's go back to the House of Commons. Classic PMQs unpacked. We're going to Labour MP Jerry Sutcliffe. Mr Speaker, I wonder if the Prime Minister is aware of the reports today that the National Health Service is in near collapse in the north-west of England. Oh, and everywhere else. Bed shortages, people waiting on trolleys. And could I also say to him that he's in crisis in Bradford as well. 289 operations cancelled in the last quarter. A much-needed accident emergency unit we were promised but not delivered after so many years. And we have the outrage of two new mixed-sex wards. Two new mixed sex wards that the Prime Minister said would not happen. Yeah. Isn't the truth that there's two health services, like there's two Tory parties? A health service, a real health service that's near collapse, and a fantasy health service that the Prime Minister talks about in the press. Yeah. 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 Well, the, uh... Tell us about fantasy land, says Dennis Skinner. Well, if the Honourable Gentleman waits a moment, you'll hear what I have to say about yeah. it. Yeah. The Honourable Gentleman referred to the North West in his question. He might perhaps have begun by acknowledging the brand new 2.9 million extension to the A&E department at the Royal Liverpool Hospital, opened just a year or so ago, which makes it one of the finest A&E hospitals uh, departments in the country. He shakes his head. He doesn't think it's one of the finest. I do, Madam Speaker. I think it's one of the uh, finest. The demand for the National Health Service is rising, and so, and so is the capacity to meet that demand, which is why more patients are being treated. Every health authority has made its own plan for dealing with the growth of demand we're seeing this year, and my right honourable friend has already made additional sums available to deal with that demand. Yeah. So, uh, the state of the NHS, a Prime Minister 20 points, 25 points behind in the polls being lambasted about the state of the NHS. The echo from the front of the, the Times today, just one in four people say the NHS is working. Um, uh, I'm not sure... Jeff Jerry Sutcliffe is an MP for Bradford South. Might be that excited about the fact that Liverpool's had a new hospital. Well, he talks about the Royal Liverpool Hospital, which is currently being... The, the version of it John Major is talking about is literally, as we speak, being demolished. Is uh, it? So, yeah, the uh, the iconic concrete Royal Liverpool Hospital uh, is uh, is being torn down. So it's no longer one of the finest. It's no longer... Well, the new one, uh, I've never been, but is uh, every friend of mine who's had an appointment there says it's amazing, uh, amazing new facility. But the version John Major is talking about is literally being knocked down as we speak. So... Uh, Jerry Sutcliffe might have begun by acknowledging the brand new extension, but he wouldn't get very far. Uh, it's, but it is very, it's fascinating, right? And, and it, this tells the same story that the Labour Party are sort of responding to now, which is 
public services at a state or perceived to be at a state of near total collapse. Um, and that is basically what voters are reacting to. Yeah, no, it's um, uh, and just the echo suit time. We think everything is brand new and the arguments about uh, saying one thing in private and saying one thing in public or the state of the NHS or, um, you know, it, political infighting. Oh, it's all unprecedented. It's not unprecedented. Everything's happened before. Uh, right, let's round off then uh, with a final question from Peter Bottomley. What are the few people still an MP? Uh, after all this time, he's now the father of the house. Senior Labour officials just got in touch to say Jerry Sutcliffe is a legend, by the way. So there there we are. They're all listening. Uh, so uh, Peter Bottomley, Conservative MP, asking a question to uh, Prime Minister John Major. Mr Peter Bottomley. Would my right honourable friend agree that one shouldn't unfairly, or even fairly, always go back to what people put in their election addresses in the 1980s, but might want to look at what they put in their election addresses at the last election? And then wonder how many of those policies they've reversed in the last five years. Well, I think, uh, Madam Speaker, it is, uh, it is possible, possible, possible that I, it, it, I'm prepared to offer a prize to anyone who can find five policies that the Right Honourable Gentleman has been consistent on. There we are. There's his, there's his last zinger. A prize to anyone who can find five policies on which Tony Blair is being consistent. It's amazing, actually. That I didn't think I'd fully appreciated just how much in that period, in the run-up to the 1997 election, that Blair was accused of being all over the place and being inconsistent, um, saying one thing here and one thing there. Well, and, and the echo, therefore the echoes were today. One thing there, one, th one thing here, one thing there, inexperienced, not having any substance behind the rhetoric. It is exactly the attacks you hear, see on Keir Starmer now, levelled at Tony Blair. And even some Labour people will draw the unfavourable comparison. I'll say, look, Tony knew exactly what he wanted to do. He, had, he was so intensely political. I mean, even if that's true, even if the idea that Keir Starmer is less political than Tony Blair is true, didn't do Tony Blair much good at this point in the electoral cycle. Nobody was saying, uh, certainly uh, in, in, in bits of the mainstream press, we're not saying, oh, Tony Blair is, you know, such a, a radical and interesting thinker. You know, beyond sort of Will Hutton in, in, in The Observer or whatever, most people were saying exactly the same things that are now being said about Keir Starmer. Yeah, no, it's fa absolutely fascinating. Loads of you have uh, been getting in touch. Uh, Mike says, Tony Blair did the hopey, changey thing to a T and that's worth more than 100 well-crafted parliamentary questions. In 1997, the country were done with the toys. They are done with them now. Out of ideas, out of road, soon to be out of office. It's interesting that, I mean, I suppose partly because it was about the debating change. It feels more like a thing that we are peering in on the sort of argument being played out. Exactly. Than, it's it's than, a dialogue in a yeah. way that it's not just two people So each, each question isn't, isn't, each other. It isn't like, you know, restating the position and so it could all be clipped up for social media. It's a debate happening in the House of Commons, you know, in the cauldron of debate, aimed at each other and their, their backbenches in which we're sort of peering in on it, which makes a slight difference. Um, H uh, has got in touch saying, uh, I assume not from Steps, uh, loving the 1997 look back, I was three years old then. So thank you for that, that's very good. Um, and uh, Sarah says, we played grandmother's footsteps in Yorkshire too. The same game in Wales was apparently called London. Which, if anything, Sarah, uh, has confused me uh, <laughs> even more. Uh, that was Classic PMQ's Unpacked. Uh,